Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker Phil Harvey. Phil is known for his gargantuan folders, drawn to outrageous sizes and engineered to impossible tolerances. Next to a Phil Harvey Gladius, for instance, even the most XL cold steel folders are mere child's play. I had uh, seen glimpses of Phil's folders in the wild, but got a real close up through the videos of my buddy and YouTuber Dirk Werning. Do check out his video uh, close-ups of Phil's folders. Uh, these knives are different because in addition to dazzling the eye, uh, they activate the brain. They make me think, and that can be dangerous. You all know that. Uh, we'll talk about these sublime pocket knives with Phil right here. But first, please be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell uh, for new videos when they're uploaded. And you can also download the show to your favorite podcast apps and listen while you do the other things that you have to do. Um, also, you can become a patron at Patreon and uh, be entered into knife giveaways and get exclusive content like uh, like interview extras we're going to get here from Phil tonight as well. So uh, the quickest way to do that is to head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Hey, Phil, welcome to the show. It's good to have you here, sir. Um, so as I mentioned up front in the introduction, I had um, your knives have kind of been legendary, at least in in my sort of research into the knife world, popping up here and there and shocking and amazing. Um, and then I, I became buds with uh, Dirk Werning and he has a collection of your work. And um, each each knife uh, he revealed was more shocking than the one before it. And yes. uh I know that this is your daily work. Shocking might be a weird term for you to hear, but they are unique and and different. Um, so I, I'm really glad I got to know your work through through his collection and his videos. But you are over in England. Tell me about uh, how you got started. And before we even start this conversation, please hold up that Gladius you were showing so people have some reference as to what you make. Okay. So this is the sensible, uh, most pocketable uh, knife I think I think that you make. Tell me yeah, about it and tell me about your work. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite old school, uh, the way I go about things. Um, I've sort of tried, you know, Fusion 360 and all that. I haven't got anything against CNC, but my sort of brain starts melting. So I think the, uh, the youngest machine in my shop is probably from the 60s. Um, everything's done on a lathe and milling machine, uh, grinder I made, heat treat oven, stuff like that, all very old stuff and all like handmade. Um, the shock in nature of them, um, some people say, I, uh, the thing is I've, I've seen, um, probably one other custom, custom knife other than my own over the years. So I kind of came from a sort of a starting point of not really you know, not having any preconceived ideas. So they didn't seem that overbuilt to me at the start. Um, and then sort of over time, I sort of respond from what customers ask for, really. So it's always, you know, can you make the blade thicker? Can you make it bigger? Can you make it more gigantuan? Um, and I sort of go from there, really. Obviously, the, uh, the cleavers are kind of pushing the envelope now, and I'm working on a folding scythe at the moment, uh, just because someone asked for that. Well, what was your starting point? If uh, if you had only ever seen one custom knife before you embarked on your own uh, creative uh, voyage there, what was your frame of reference? Were you doing something else creative? Um, I was working in um, office admin in oncology research. Um, I hadn't actually, I, I saw the one other custom knife along the journey. My starting point really was I was sort of 
interested in knives from a collector standpoint. Um, I went on YouTube and did what everyone did back there, then, which was watch Jeff Blavitt Tough Thumbs mm -hmm. and Jim Skelton videos and just went on a marathon of them, collected a few knives and thought, I don't really want to do this job anymore. I'll give uh, custom knife making a go. So I just started making things up, really, just started drawing. What was your uh, what was your first big folder and and how did it get out into the world? Um, that was the Gladius. I um, I drew the Gladius before I had a knife making workshop, um, and just sort of you know just got the machines together around them. Um, I put a few photos on Instagram. I think a few um, influencers, sort of knife related inf influencers, found me and promoted it a bit, and it just kind of blew up from the start, really. Um, before then, I had some sort of little fixed blades and um, like a friction folder that I quite liked. <laughs> Someone seems one guy seems to have collected all those friction folders in this in the state, strangely enough. I saw a picture of them the other day. But yeah, once I put the Gladius on there, it just it must have been unusual to people, and I sort of got followers from there, really. Uh Jim Skelton reached out and I sent one to him. And obviously, you sort of know what happens then. And, yeah. Uh, just, <laughs> it's just away from there, really. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. You, I mean, you mentioned these friction. But look at that. I mean, geez, that is amazing. What yes. is that? I'm, I'm sorry. Stop right there, Jim. What is that top row of knives? If you're, uh, if you're only listening, we're looking at some pretty giant cleavers, but one of them looks kind of dinosaur-like. Man, look at this thing. Yeah, that's the quarter slice. Quarter, sl the quarter slice. Um, okay, so. <laughs> All right. So you start drawing knives. You you decide that you want to um, start making knives. It's from a collector's perspective. You mentioned that there is a collector in the United States that, who has all of your early obscure friction folders. Mm. Uh, it occurs to me that your knives um, kind of straight across the board are 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 made for collectors. They're they're uh, they're they're niche knives to 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 the max. Uh, and uh, I'm someone who loves overbuilt knives. And when I saw when I saw, um, it, I think it was the cleaver first. I thought of that uh, Rene Magritte painting with the pipe, Sene Pau and Peep. It's called the, uh, uh, I went to art history school, so oh, they okay. made a big deal about this painting, the, the treachery of images. And it's, it's basically showing a, a painting of a pipe that you smoke, but it's saying this isn't a pipe. It's basically saying this is a painting. And that's kind of what I think of when I see your knives. Like I know they cut, and I know that they're extremely well made, but they're also a representation of knives. Yeah, um, I sort of looked at the time, um, you know, where custom knife making was going. And it was sort of, you know, as the start of the overbuilt sort of craze and they were just getting thicker and bigger. And I just thought, well, where's the end game for this? Um, so I just kind of tried to jump straight to there really. So, I mean, that that um, quarter slice one that you just showed, that's got a five-eighths thick blade on it. Wow. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, they predominantly go to collectors. They do occasionally go to someone that beats them up and uses them, uh, but that's not the rule. Um, tree surgeons being a, an obvious one. So, uh, yeah, I sent one out to a tree surgeon in California um, it came back a year later and it had, it had been through hell, <laughs> to... <laughs> but I like that, you know, that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think um... he was just cutting through scrub and just cutting small branches and stuff with it the whole time, just letting it go rusty and <laughs> he was fine with that. Yeah. I have an image of a guy way up high in a tree, like not quite having the right tool and pulling out whoosh, his, his giant Phil Harvey and just hewing off limbs with it. Pretty much, yeah. He had a giant. He was like seven feet tall as well. I had to um, change the dimensions of it. His hands were so. I thought he was joking when they, I asked for his hand oh measurements. God. I thought he was joking. I was like, a human hand can't possibly be that big. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I ended up making him a knife. It wasn't a cleaver. It's um, well, it was as heavy as a cleaver. It's quite low down on my Instagram feed. Uh, that one, but it was yeah, it was enormous. So just in looking through your catalog of work. Uh, it seems like you do a lot of individualized uh, one-off designs. Is that right? Um, I, I try and make each one a bit different. Mm -hmm. 
and I am sort of open to suggestions, but they do tend to follow, you know, sometimes like recently it's taken me like six months to design the knife. So it's kind of, you know, I can't really change one thing without changing everything. So it'll be sort of a gladius, a uh, original peacemaker, a quarter slice or something. And then if they want to tweak it, make it bigger, smaller, different colors, that sort of thing. I'll go with that. I did do a Gladius once where he wanted a Tanto blade and he literally just sent me a chicken scratch on a like a post-it note. And I was like, oh, okay, I uploaded it into CAD and went with that. But usually people just, you know, they just sort of want like one of my sort of staple models really. Okay, so you were talking before about uh, you don't use CNC, but you do use CAD. Uh, tell me about your design process um kind of soup to nuts how you're inspired and then um how it goes all the way to a finished drawing soup to nuts <laughs> you know to me. um <laughs> yeah i don't know where it, well i mean i'll get like the the um the peacemakers um i mean there's several different ones they're all cleavers but someone just emailed me and said i want a crazy folding cleaver so using that as an example, um, okay, you want a crazy folding cleaver. I took him literally as in, okay, you want something that will cleave through a leg of lamb. So it had to have the weight to it. Um, and then I'll just sort of draw over and over again, um, you know, just sort of on pen and paper. And I thought, sort of thought crazy, okay, how am I going to do that? So it was with proportions. So the first one, you know, you, it, when it's folded and closed, it looks like the blade's just plonked on top of it. And it's just just insane proportions, just, you know, it doesn't look like it should work. And so I just sort of went, you know, sort of Salvador Dali kind of, you know, surrealist type type approach to it, really, and just make everything as thick as possible. Yeah, I mean, it has got really graceful, beautiful lines that are all, it, it's all very unexpected but it works so nicely together. And like you said, it doesn't look like that blade should be able to fold into that handle. It looks like, uh, it just looks like it won't fit, you know, like uh, once it once it curves around that pivot, like, uh, but man, I mean, I'm just looking at this. To me, this is real art, uh, art knives. You know, there's a difference. I don't know. There are the art knives that are really exquisite uh, with, incredible amounts of detail that you might see in a like a master bladesmith's um mm. test knife but this is artistic to me the, the, these are art knives because they're um really like nothing you've ever seen before in terms of the lines very graceful very beautiful to look at but also like i said they're you know they 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 can't you can't help but look at that and 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 wonder if it's supposed to be real and usable and and you are saying uh, that this tree surgeon has used it and other people use it. I know that a lot of collectors collect them for their, for, you know, what they are. Um, but to me, this is real art knife because art is something that makes you ponder. Mm. Um, you know, it's not just the ability to uh, do a lot of intricate things. Well, it's the ability to make someone think. And, and uh, I don't mean to keep coming back to this. Well, but that's what I get from your work. Yeah, I suppose the, um, you know, the, the artistic element, I sort of went with a bit of brutalism rather than, say, classics. Um, so that's kind of, you know, I'll look at like old architecture and things like that and just like have a surrealist element to it as well. Um, I sort of thought, you know, like just because a knife is extremely overbuilt doesn't mean it has to have an industrial finish on it. Like you can put fine finishes on it and have it huge and industrial at the same time. So I've sort of always sort of tried to blend those two together. Obviously, I like an industrial finish and appreciate that work, but it just seemed like a different avenue for me to go in that other people haven't really done that much. Um, yeah, they do. I mean, there's a, a there's a video on my Instagram of one split in a um, like a four by four piece of wood. But I doubt many people are doing that, especially since they take, you know, a few weeks to make and they're quite expensive, I suppose. You do like knowing that, or, or me as a collector, I as a collector who does not abuse his knives, mm. do like to see videos of other people abusing the same models I have to know that yeah. they can withstand that. But my mind don't have to go through that. <laughs> How do no, you... 
Yeah, right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I like knowing that they're capable of it, but mine, I'm going to keep pristine, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Let other people do that. So where does CAD, computer assisted design, where does that come into your process and how is it useful to you? Um, obviously, I mean, sort of my inspiration comes from pencil sketches. I can't really get a lot done that way on a computer. So I use this only really simple 2D CAD software, LibreCAD. Um, I'll basically upload the picture straight into it and have it in the background. I'll draw the lines around it. And just because I've drawn it on a piece of paper doesn't mean it's actually going to work. Right. Um, so I'll kind of, you know, get my pencil image in the CAD and then you can rotate the blade, see if it closes properly. And I just sort of tweak them from there to make them work and just sort of look at the, you know, the engineering of different bits. I like it to sort of be balanced, um, you know, even if people aren't, most people aren't necessarily going to use them that much. You know, I wouldn't put like a, like a four mil pivot on one, for instance, um, just because, you know, like if the blade's extremely thick and overbuilt and I want the stop pin to be thick, the pivot to be thick, I'll use like a very heavy lock bar, even though most people will just be sort of flicking them open and stuff, but just, you know, just for that extra sort of meat in the lock recess, just for extra lock strength. Right. There was a sort of a very, I, I was on my YouTube channel that's been deleted because it got hacked. Um, there was a, a video, I had a Gladius and I was doing the spine whacking test with it. Um, but I was whacking it so hard, it was, even though it was the blunt end, I was like taking chips out of the table. <laughs> Wait, hold that, hold that up again, Phil. If okay, you I'll try and get the... Uh, so how, how how thick would you say that handle is standard thickness we say is around maybe a half inch to point point six that looks like it's considerably more that'd be about an inch i reckon an inch yeah roughly a little less maybe no it's probably an inch yeah and i can see the pocket clip on there as well and that swedge comes to a pretty thin edge on the back i could see how you could definitely take so you, you said you like uh you like a good balance so where do you where do you try and balance the the folders like what, well just um, the handle oh okay oh um yeah i do have a slightly uh well, be sort of full finger okay yeah it's a little bit further back i've had um i usually put sort of a bronze or a steel uh backspacer and i noticed if i use titanium it starts to feel a bit front heavy Obviously, the big cleavers, uh, they're going to be front heavy no matter what, but that's kind of the idea of them. Right. But yeah, just so it's sort of a little bit sort of tactile. I mean, it's just what it feels like when you pick it up, really. Just behind the pivot, really. So you're in England, and, um, you know, we have a vague notion in the States here that England has some pretty strict knife laws. How does that, how does that work in terms of your making these things and selling them and that, that kind of stuff? Or is that something we shouldn't talk about? <laughs> oh, no, I'll talk about it. <laughs> I've had uh, sort of quite a few back and forth to uh, MPs. I think part of the um, sort of the aggressiveness of my knife designs is probably as rebellion to that. It's, uh, you know, we'll have some sort of gang violence in an inner city and the government's answer, rather than policing it properly, is to just ban some random type of knife. And I mean, I don't know what North Korea is doing, but I think England's probably the least knife friendly country in the world um so i mean these days you can't have um autos flick knives whatever they are and um, you can't have flippers apparently um yeah it's very limited but um i think the way i work around it is my stuff so weird that they haven't thought up a law to ban it yet so it kind of works like that but yeah i just i just sort of ignore it i think it was it um was it Benjamin Franklin? He sort of said, uh, if there's an unjust law, you have a duty to disregard it. Something uh, like that. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Yeah. Not that I'm sort of blatantly illegal, but in any way, really. But you know, I, I kind of keep within the law and I can be creative enough within that, really. A straight folding knife that locks is legal here. You just can't carry it. Yes, I believe you could easily, easily... Um you justify the making of your knives. If you were making shivs and, and little self-defense implements and stuff like that, it'd be a much harder to defend, but your work is so obviously, um, you know, highly refined and just, you know, 
you could say this is kinetic sculpture. Yeah, it's got a sharp edge, but this is kinetic sculpture and I'm an artist. So buzz off, you know, yeah. you might, <laughs> even that might work. I could try it if the police show up, I guess. <laughs> we have a. It, they it, tend to sort of it, leave us alone. I don't think they realize that knife maker is even a job in the UK, the politicians. So. Right, right. There's a lot of. Uh, I do think, uh, and we covered it a little bit on this show, how at, a, at one point they were trying to pass a law in uh, Great Britain that, that would disallow sh uh, pointy chef's knives um, because they were determining, you know, that most. Uh, knife crime was happening uh, with the use of cheap kitchen knives uh, that you just you, you simply remedy that by blunting and selling only blunt ended uh, knives. And, and I think that really worked. And I think it changed the hearts and minds of people all over England. And now there's no problem. Yeah, I, I, I think I heard about that. I heard another one where they, were, they wanted to put tracking devices inside handles of knives so that they could trace knife crime. They had some loony ideas at one point. But yeah, most, most knife violence is kitchen knives, isn't it? Not that it sort of comes into my thought process, really. You know, I don't make them to be, um, you know, violent necessarily. They might look aggressive, but it's not their design, really. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, you know, they're, they don't exactly look light and fast. They're not exactly something you want to square up with someone with a little stiletto with, you know. No, I'm not. A, I'm not a fighting knife guy. Knife guy. I mean, sort of thinking about it, if someone, you know, no, no one's going to wait three years on a waiting list to order a knife to go out and kill someone anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a hell of a cool down period. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose they really thought it through at that point, but it's and you know, if they wanted to be discreet about it, I mean, mine aren't exactly the most subtle, you know, and they don't sell that many, so it's going to get traced back to them pretty quick. Yeah, so it's a bit of a ridiculous sort of thing to think about, really. Yeah, a two thousand dollar murder weapon. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. <laughs> so, uh, who are your? Um, you said that you came to this uh, from a collector's perspective. Who are the designers or custom knife makers that really inspired you in terms of their work? Um, well, I was broke at the time, so I didn't actually collect any of them. Um, I've always been into um, there's the same sort of street as uh, Todd and Frank Fisher, Stan Wilson. Um, I have a bit of trouble with them. I try not to look at other makers' knives um, just so I can try and stay original. And the number of times I've drawn a handle that you know has been similar to something Stan Wilson's done. Um, obviously, I looked at Medford thing like that. And um, the sort of stuff I collect would be like um, well, there's a World War II bayonet. Um, I have some. I use this as a pizza slicer. Um, just Benchmade Spydercos, really. I didn't. I didn't have the kind of bank to be um, pulling in, you know, really expensive stuff. Michael Walker, obviously, he's a yeah. legend. He's got, you know, we all use the same locking mechanism as him. I quite like, um, you know, yeah, Michael Walker, Ron Best. I like to sort of, you know, look at someone's work and not be able to work out how they did it i sort of call it that wizard level of knife makers like you know like his pivot designs and his sort of inlays with square corners and stuff you know i look at that and i just i can't work it out and i like that sort of thing and i sort of try and emulate that in my own work although once i start getting fancy it seems to get less sellable and people like the sort of brutalist almost sim simplistic mm. type stuff which i'm happy to make uh, interesting. That's that sort of knife maker's knife maker. You, you're looking at a Michael Walker knife and and not being able to figure out how he did it. Yeah, that's. Uh, I guess from one artist to another, that's a uh, yeah, that's a major compliment. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, he invented everything, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. I sort of every time I come up with what I think's a bright idea, I find out Michael Walker <laughs> did it back in the eighties and better. Yeah. So <laughs> did it better and retired the idea altogether. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And um, well, I mean, if you, well, <laughs> sort of turning this into a Michael Walker rant, if you follow his Instagram, you know, he's got, I think he went up the mountains and built himself a log cabin with a chainsaw at the start and just made knives out of that. Yeah, he's up in Taos, New Mexico, I believe. Yeah. And it's, if you've ever been there, that's a sublime environment. It's weird and beautiful and deserty, mm. high desert. 
good good place to uh, steal away to to be creative. I imagine so. He, he just seems to have that sort of Renaissance man sort of you know thing going about him. Oddly, I had to um, do a workshop move um, fairly recently. I sort of lost my own workshop, and it's uh, Cornwall, UK has a like a housing crisis, and they just uh, any building. If you want a building for something, it's extremely hard. So sort of seeing him with that log cabin, I've uh, sort of I'm thinking about getting a uh, like a horse lorry, like a big, you know, high payload lorry, and just putting all my knife making stuff in there, about ten tons of it. Oh wow! And just parking it in a field somewhere because there's nowhere to rent around it. Okay, I- I'm sorry. Let me let me get this straight. You're saying that there's a housing crisis in the United Kingdom, and they're telling you that any accessory structure like a shed or a workshop you have to vacate or... no 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 my current workshop had to vacate um ex-girlfriend problem oh oh oh, oh <laughs> i got you i'm sorry when you brought and, up... and then i sort of went on a i probably was being a bit vague and i yeah i was, I was like okay i'll rent a unit easy enough and okay. there just aren't any or they're you know like a grand a month and i don't want to be working you know it's, it's like more expensive to rent a workshop unit than it is a house it'd be cheaper for me to get rent a house if i could find one right and just do it in the garage so yeah there's a, there's some quite strict planning laws around here and not a lot of this stuff's been built so yeah i'm sort of getting to the stage i'm just going to put it in a lorry and just be a tour and knife maker or something like that yeah yeah uh, stop by restaurants sharpen their knives for a little extra dough <laughs> Yeah, it could do. You know, like <laughs> uh, that's that's actually not a bad plan. Yeah, um, I have a couple of. I have uh, one friend, uh, you know, online friend, um, who lives actually in Northern Ireland, and I know that they have a real, they have real strict knife laws there too. And mm-hmm. and I think that if you if you lay low and you're a collector, you can probably get away with it, kind of like I have with uh, switch blades here in my state. I'm not allowed to have, though. Uh, in, in a couple of weeks here, it will be legal, which is awesome. Um, mm. But yeah, I think a lot of the times it's about laying low and just, uh, you know, doing your thing and, um, you know, not disrupting the peace, not not making a, a reason for the cops to come by. And then maybe yeah, not, not going on pub, uh, podcasts and publicizing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Like really, really lives in Cornwall. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. what's a, what's a, what is your present? Uh, you know, we were talking about Taos and how it's kind of a uh, a great place to be creative. What's Cornwall like? Um. Yeah, there's sort of some art history here, like St. Ives and stuff. And um, there's a bit of a sort of a hippie scene here, but um, I wouldn't say it's especially creative compared to anywhere else really it's uh yeah i don't <laughs> like you don't see many sort of knives around here i mean there's um, a few of my friends are um artists and they do really detailed paintings um mostly sort of you know coastal scenery and stuff i wouldn't say it's like a huge art mecca in cornwall really it's more of a sort of a tourist county okay so you're you're in this uh you know, small tourist county in England, and yet you have this giant international following, or, or I should say, loyal international following. How, how do you, um, how do you kind of get out there? How do you reach out to uh, the people that you're making knives for, and you know, the the knife world? You're 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 well known, but how how do you get it out there? Um, Instagram mostly, and uh, people like you. I've not I've not been to a knife show. It's uh, <laughs> I keep meaning to go to Blade, but obviously we had a, a slight pandemic problem as well, which put a bit of, put a bit of a halt to that. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's really word of mouth and and Instagram. And I used to have a YouTube channel, which I'm going to have to get started again. Um, mostly that just focused on, you know, the equipment around knife making, and I'd occasionally show a knife in it. But that that you know had a, like a thousand subscribers. Um, like yeah, social media, Facebook's sort of getting a bit bigger. Instagram, that's about it really. And obviously, um, you know, Dirk Werning's a top bloke, and uh, he's you yeah. know shown quite a few of them on his channel. Yeah. And Jim Skelton, obviously. So they, the word gets out that way, really. I mean, so it's, a bit, this... it's, a bit of, it's a bit of a freak show, I suppose. Some people sort of see them as a freak show, so they're going to get spread around on forums and things like that. 
you have this incredibly visual medium, obviously, of Instagram, and that's a great place. That's that's mm. where I discover so many knife makers because you can see their work immediately. Um, uh, the the thought of bringing your stuff there and showing everything there and and then getting hands on that's like two different things and um you know i was thinking about blade show because i was just there and uh you um i think i think one of these years if you can make it after this whole thing blows over i think you would be uh, a, a phenom there i think people would be uh so excited to to actually get a chance to get their hands on your work mm. um because it it is so unusual so unlike uh other people's stuff but it, from what i've gotten from dirk it is it is uh, the same sort of quality from all the most delicate and intricate small knives uh just blown up um yeah so when you're when you're setting about to do something like this to design one of these knives to make one of these knives how did how do you determine the dimensions how big this thing is going to be because um from that side angle it is one thing but then when you turn it and you feel and you see how big it is like I i'm just curious what how how you go into that aspect of it well de determining the, the dimensions the pure, the pure scale yeah the pure scale oh okay so i'll, I'll use um libracad get the design finalized in there um, and then I'll print it off, basically, just black lines um, on a piece of A4 paper. And I don't know, I, you know, I print, like I print it off in different scales and just sort of say 15 to 1 or whatever, you know, and plug that into the printer. And every time I print them off, you know, I'll have like a smaller one and a bigger one printed out. And I'll sort of cut it out in cardboard and feel it. And I just, I just always go for the bigger one. It just seems better, you know. So. Yeah. The gladius I had to scale down a little bit. They were getting so they like I do want the gladius to fit in people's pockets easily. So I scaled it down a little bit. It's still you know big, but they were just getting bigger and bigger. And it's like, well, you know, I've got cleavers for that. I want I want them to actually be able to carry this one. Do you have any designs for anything smaller? And what would that look like? Um, yeah, right at the bottom of my Instagram, <laughs> if you want to scroll that far. But um, yeah, I did some little fixed blades. Um, the friction folders, they only had like a two and a half inch blade, um, but um, they didn't really sell. So, so I sort of followed the market there really. Is, <laughs> but, but now having followed the market and having made what you've made and being known for that, if you were to scale back down, mm. do you think they would look different from say those initial friction folders, maybe small versions of what you're doing now? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, the friction folder, I've sort of updated that design and did it like a year or two ago, I think. Um, I just sort of messed around with the lines a little bit um, and I sold one of them. And I think I've had one guy ask for one since. Um, I mean, if, you know, like like I am a custom maker. If someone like someone, the, the cleaver I'm currently working on, he asked if I could scale that down a little bit. Hey, Jim. Uh, Jim, stop right there. Actually, scroll back up a little bit. So, okay, we were talking about, so that knife in the center right there, that drop mm. point, that looks very pocketable. Uh, that's what I was thinking. And then I look at the backspacer in the center. <laughs> you got to tell me about that backspacer and others like it. Yeah, it's just a cog backspace. I think it's solid bronze there. I can't quite see it. Oh, okay, it, that's my face again. I think <laughs> I think he's going to go large on it. That yeah, center I, think, I think that's just my aesthetic. You know, I just want to go thick. So all the other stuff I make, I end up, I made someone a birthday card recently out of 10 mil thick steel plate <laughs> and welded cool. happy birthday on it with some nails and stuff. Uh, but that backspacer looks like a saw blade, at least in this, in this, uh, with the way the shadows are falling on it. I take it. It's not, it's not sharp like that, but so I was, what I'm getting at is I was looking at, it, I was like, Oh, that looks like a very reasonable pocketable blade. And then I saw the backspacer and I was like, wait, I take it back. Oh, yeah, I just can't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> I love this knife, this Gladius is is uh, really a beautiful knife, man. Uh, he was okay. just scrolling by it. I really like the giant fuller in the middle. I love the symmetry of it. Um, uh, the handles that you make uh, with the, especially on the, um, especially on the Gladius, have a lot of partitioning. They have a lot of uh, finger grooves and that kind of thing. When you're making uh, 
uh, when you're taking a custom order, say, like, say for instance, if I ordered a Gladius from you, mm -hmm. would I tell you the size of my hands to get, the, and you would make it a, so that those scallops fit, or do you have just like a standard size that you that you make, or like how do how custom is custom? Um, you could do certainly. I've done that before. Um, usually I ship them in a sort of a standard size, but um, if someone wants to send their hand measurements, I mean, you know, I'm printing off um, a piece of paper with lines on it and cutting it out. It doesn't, it's, you know, I can do it either way. It doesn't make a difference to me. So if oh. someone had small hands, I could make it a bit smaller. It'd I get easy. it. You, you scale it by a percentage uh, in CAD and then print it out and you have the size that you need. Like if I told you, yeah, okay, I get it. Yeah, I'm there with a pair of scissors and I cut the handle out of paper, stick it to a piece of titanium and then go to the, well, I, I don't actually use a bandsaw because like I know knife makers use bandsaws, but if you put in like a, an eight mil thick piece of titanium into a vertical bandsaw, your thumbs start to get sore quite quickly. So what I actually do is I, um, I go to the drill press and I just drill holes all the way around the profile. Oh my God. Um, and then I'll, um, I've got a plasma cutter, which will go to, through titanium fine. And all the little some kind of slivers between the holes, I'll just blast that off with the um, plasma cutter. And because the holes are there, the um, sort of heat affected zone doesn't get into the titanium, which would ruin it. Because and it's such I'll... a tiny little, tiny little piece of titanium between the holes. Yeah, yeah. If I, if I tried to cut the whole thing with titanium, you'd get a heat affected zone and it wouldn't anodize properly and it'd be really brittle and just horrible. But putting the holes there just makes it a lot quicker. And then I just take it to the grinder and just blast off all the little nubs and stuff. Also, that plasma clutter slag is, um, I mean, it's titanium oxide. Um, so if I did, at, <laughs> at one point I had, I had um, I've got a three-dimensional pantograph mm -hmm. and I put a jig on it that would hold a plasma cutter head. And then went, the way you use a plasma cutter, you'd, um, you know, I'd have a two times scale a model of the knife that I'd cut out of wood and I'd, I'd plasma cut on the pantograph but the um the titanium oxide slag on it is as soon as you put that to a grinder it's just ripping the abrasive off and just oh. torturing it so but the holes it'll just kind of knock it off it's really brittle so it'll just knock it out rather than trying to grind through it right so that that whole process of going around uh, what is what is uh, presumably a pretty large frame on a mm. pretty thick piece of titanium, making holes with a drill, I, I, presumably a drill press. That sounds maddening. Um, you must put in uh, soothing music or some sort of meditation to get through that, <laughs> or that might be part of the the process that is uh, meditative to you or, or or flow like like. Does how how does your process, um, you know, your creative process? How does it feed back into the knives? Um, by creative process, do you mean design or like my methods for? No, I mean like your methods. You're st I, I see you at a drill press making a thousand yeah. holes very close to one another around a drawn out frame so you can mm. remove it from the titanium so that you don't overheat it so that you get a nice anodization later. Like that's a that's you're you're thinking many steps ahead and you're and the process itself seems like a, it 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 strains the, the you know the ability to tolerate. <laughs> well, my my soothing music is uh, tall usually. So <laughs> oh, good choice. Yeah, tall and caffeine. But um, uh, sort of after you after you've done, like I'm I'm getting quite quick at it. It still takes ages, but it's still quicker than trying to put it through a band sort of really. But yeah, it's just sort of you know like that sort of pace. So and like moving it across, and you've got a huge bird's nest of swarf on it, but it, it does get through it. I would like to sort of find a better method, really, but obviously titanium, you can't get it too hot or steel for that matter. So that's what I've got at the moment. I could send it out to Waterjet, I guess, but I don't like outsourcing. It's sort of I just like to be able to, you know, walk up to whatever machine and do it straight away rather than waiting for a, a Waterjet shop to sort of send it to me. I mean, if they make a water jet that you can have in your own garage, I'll be right up for that. But until then, right. it's sort of all done myself. Well, that's not kind of in the nature of your work to do big batches of the same thing. So I could see how that wouldn't make sense. Mm. You know, yeah, I think um, like six knives at a time is like my record. Six it, um, knives at a time. That's cool. Yeah, the uh, well, the hand sat and finishing process, obviously, with all the 
fullers and everything, it's quite time consuming. If you try and do six in a row, you start to go a little bit potty. So I sort of keep them to like four, two or six, really, depending on what I want to take on. Um, I'm thinking of people who who might not be familiar um, with the with the hand finishing process mm. on a knife. Tell tell people who might not understand what that entails. What that entails. Well, I have some sort of very like I was thinking of making a YouTube video on how to hand sat and finish a knife, and I thought it's not a good idea because I have some very weird methods. But um, basically, I'll, I'll take it to the grinder and I've got, you know, small wheels for the fullers and a flat plan. I'll just grind it the standard way. Um, and then, yeah, it's, um, I'll take it up to like 120 grit. It's not necessarily the finish that slows you down, hand sat and finishing. It's like kind of distortions in the blade, like, you know, like dimensional distortions if it's not flat and it's supposed to be. So I'll get it to like 120 grinding and then I'll start with like stark matador paper um, and carpet glue. And I've got all these little wheels for the fullers and big flat bits of steel and I'll stick it to them and just just go at it basically. You know, the standard way doing it at different angles. And I've got an oven that cooks off the paper and I'll stick another piece of paper on. I'll typically get through um, like a 50 sheet ream of like stark matador paper for a knife wow. like a big quarter slice cleaver type thing i want them sort of like the fullers i want to you know i want the flats to sort of be optically correct mm -hmm. so it'll like i mean this i only take it up to 320 grit because i quite like the look of it but i want it so that the light hits it like you know if you're looking down from the point of the blade and you look up the full i want people to be able to tilt it in the light and see the light kind of flow up the fuller like yeah. evenly like a perfect sort of hemisphere so that's what i'm trying to achieve anyway <laughs> well th this to me is uh, uh seems to be another area kind of like putting the holes in that is painstaking that you have to get correct because when i look at your blades i see um especially we're talking about the cleaver i see multiple planes i see curved planes like in the fuller and everything is crisp you know you're 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 literally hand sanding steel back and forth back and forth and yet mm. still the transitions between that curved plane of the fuller and then the flat plane of the swedge or the edge itself um is crisp the line between the two is crisp and to me that's something that i i don't understand how, you know obviously i'm not a uh, a, a knife maker but uh, to to get that edge um but that transition edge to be so crisp to me, that seems part of the art. Like, you know, that's that, that requires practice and talent. Yeah. I mean, obviously I'm always, I'm still learning all the time. Um, after a while, it's sort of uh, muscle memory really is, um, you know, I've, I've done it so much now. It's almost like brushing your teeth or something, just a back and forth mm. motion. Um, and, you know, I can kind of look at it and sort of see the angle I need to hit it at. I mean, generally, if I do one stroke that's off, it usually takes about sort of 20 strokes to fix it. So you, yeah. you, you get punished if you mess up and then you, you know, you soon learn to sort of keep it flat, you know, on a flat plane. Well, OK, in that spirit, you say you, you say you mess up one stroke, it takes 20 strokes to fix it. What what about um, I've spoken to a lot of knife makers uh, for whom, you know, you can get so far in the process, 90% of the way there, and then make a, a false move and it kind of ruins everything. If, oh, yeah. Does does this how does this happen with you? And it seems like you're so committed when you make a knife because you're you're committing so many materials, you know, and so much actual effort to get them into shape. And I'll I'll keep referencing the drills, uh, the drill holes. Uh, how far in that process, how forgiving is your process to to make up for when something goes wrong deep into the process? Um, I mean, hand sight and finishing, you can always keep hand sight and finishing to get rid of it. Um, one time, I think I'd been making knife for like 16 hours straight and I was quite exhausted. And um, I don't know if you can, there's um, kind of a, oh, the light's awful. You can see there's like a cutout in here, like a, you know, mm. so you can get your finger in to move the lock bar. Um, I accidentally put it on the uh, the wrong side, on a, <laughs> on a finished lock side, just because I was so exhausted. And that was like 
you know, <laughs> however many days, almost a week's work down the drain in just a split second. Oh, okay. but, uh, yeah. but you could <laughs> have introduced it as the new model. <laughs> No, I didn't want to do that. People, know. <laughs> People would know you're full of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I typically use D2 for the blades, um, which uh, the, the trouble is if you go to sort of a knife supply place and you want a piece of S90V or whatever, they're not really catering for people like me, whereas obviously D2's tool steel, you can you know, bash out car body panels with it. So that's typically what I go with. But um yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. Actually. <laughs> Wait, was uh, that? are you are, are you suggesting that like if you go to a knife supply place and ask for S ninety V, you're not going to be able to get it in in? Uh, you're not going to get it sixteen mil thick, I don't think, unless you right. order a pallet of it. And I'm not that big of a business. Yeah, that's when I sort of like um, decided I liked D two was I um, one of the really early knives. Um, the, the top swedge I messed up on the grinder on a like a pretty much finished blade. And I had a bit of a hissy fit and whacked it against the paving slab. And it was like pulling chips out of this paving slab, but the blade was surprisingly intact. It wasn't like majorly, I mean, it needed a sharpen, but it wasn't majorly messed up. So it's good for that sort of thing. Uh, when you're working with steel, I mean, obviously you get a harder steel like S90V, it's going to take more abrasives, more time to mm. sculpt and such. Um, how is D2 for that part of the process, for, for grinding it and getting it into shape? Because um, I'm kind of, I pretty much exclusively use D2. I don't have a lot to compare it to. Hmm. Gotcha. Um, I used um, RWL34 once. I managed to find a piece of that, and that was a lot easier um, to hand set and finish. But that's that's all I've really got to go. Oh, and 01 as well, but <laughs> that's a bit softer as well. Oh, I'd say D2 out of those three is the hardest, but I, I don't really know what to compare it to, really. So, All right. So if someone um, forced you <laughs> to work with someone else, uh, that sounds like you don't. Like that, that I'm painting you as antisocial, and I don't mean it like that. But if you <laughs> if you had to collaborate with someone and you had mm -hmm. your choice of living knife makers uh, to collaborate with, who do you think you'd want to work with based um, on their on their knife styles? Well, I mean, it's a very different style, but it would be Michael Walker, definitely. Or uh, perhaps second choice, Ron Best. I doubt either would have me, but, I'd, you know, I'd love to sort of team up with one of them and have a look around and see how he does things. Because, I mean, he, he sort of, I, I get the impression he's like a front runner and he makes it up as he goes along as well. You know, some of the jigs I've seen him use. So it's just that sort of problem solving mind that people like that have. Um, to be honest, I'm, I've not actually been in another knife maker's shop. I think I've met one custom, other custom knife maker in the flesh. So it's probably why my methods are so weird. But yeah, I'd, I'd love to team up with someone like Michael Walker or something like that, even though it's very different styles. Yeah, I mean, so so much you could learn so much from someone like that. Mm. Um, Michael Walker. Uh, true innovator but you said ron best I, I i gotta admit i'm not sure who that is ron best i should Who, who's ron best well i, I only know his work but he's oh, got okay. a very his designs are very interesting like, it's hard to describe really but like the flowing lines and all the inlays okay i'm gonna have to and he has a i think he's sort of well obviously he's not that well known <laughs> it's probably <laughs> more i watched on jim skelton's He's one of those top tier ones, you know, up with, I mean, obviously, you know, if I wanted to learn from another knife maker, I'd want to go to people that are, you know, better than me, really. So, yeah, those, yeah, I don't know where Ron Best gets his designs ideas from, but they're, they're something else, really. Like well, this is style. this is how I learn from talking to people like you, um, because I don't I don't. I don't look at the top tier often. I mean, I, I follow Michael Walker because it's so interesting and it's always kind of like breathtaking when you see what he's working on. Um, mm. But his posts are few and far between. And and that top tier, you know, is so unattainable to me that I, I'm just not looking there until someone tells me to take a look. Um, so, yeah, I will definitely check out Ron Best. It'd be interesting to see how your style uh, would blend with someone else's style. Um, for some reason, I think of uh, uh, there's a Michigan knife maker named Jeff Vandermeulen, 
um, oh, who's, yeah. who's, whose work looks like it might be in, in, in the same universe um, as yours. But I don't know if that's the kind of collaboration. If, if I were if I were the Yenta for this collaboration, I don't think I'd go that way. I would find someone who makes the opposite work. Um, yeah. So maybe like a Michael Walker, delicate, very delicate kind of stuff and see how that collaboration works. Yeah, it's his stuff. It's like, a, you know, I'd want to learn from something from it. I don't know what he's got left to learn, but <laughs> yeah, I want to learn stuff from it. And he's sort of, you know, he's got that wizard level and so different to me. I did try and sort out, sort out a, this PM, is it PMP knives? He makes very thick stuff. It's more production yes. stuff. I was doing some back and forth with him on Instagram recently, but it didn't seem to go anywhere. But I was trying to sort of team up with him a little bit to come up with something, but it didn't seem to happen. But that's a that's that's odd that the that PMP wouldn't jump at that opportunity because I don't know how many big name collaborations they've done. There's also Midgard's Messer out of Deutschland who does those giant folders, giant oh, cool. folders. They're really cool too. Yeah, Midgard's Messer. Uh, they're a little bit ridiculous, which is which is I like. Yeah, um, we like that sort of thing. Yeah. I and mean, I sort of figure if you you know if you want a knife as a tool and you want to cut some stuff, you can get that done for like a hundred bucks. But I think if someone's you know wanting me to go to the effort of making a custom, they probably want it to turn head. So I'll sort of try my best to achieve that, and obviously have it somewhat functional as well. If you want to split logs, which <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right sure and especially if you're doing a production collaboration you have to justify it you know with uh with some practical usage you know type stuff um where where do you see um phil harvey knives where do you want to take um where do you want the knife your company and your output or or your knives themselves where do you want to take this all um you know when you retire what is that thing you want to achieve um uh, or will want to have made? Um, well, will I ever retire? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to sort of like a, you know, I want to get into the, the fine detail a bit. Um, maybe, well, sort of a bit of both, really. I, I just want to sort of push the, the techniques of it, really, sort of have, you know, get into that wizard level I sort of talked about where people look at it and they can't work out how I've done it. Um, sort of integrating more of that. I don't have anything against, um, you know, CNC and things like that. So, I mean, at some point I might like to bring in something that's a little cheaper and a little um, sort of easier to make rather than, you know, the way I design them, I don't tend to put any thought into, okay, that's going to be a pain. You know, I just sort of draw it because it looks nice and I do it. But at some point I'd like to do some something really stocky and you know sort of short but very thick materials that like i actually put some thought into how i'm going to produce it um just to get kind of a like a cheaper tier one and like uh yeah and then on the other end um, i've got this recurve model um on my instagram um, and that was more of a sort of you know i was using the pantograph to do um it was like an integral um frame like titanium mm -hmm. and then having carbon fiber inlaid into that and the I've got sort of ideas for um, like having a keyhole shape that you'd have on like um, sort of older custom knives and maybe dovetailing that shape in and then having the, the whole of the keyhole sort of screw into the carbon fiber and having it all sort of integral like that. Just doing sort of fancy stuff like that, that, mm. you know, makes people sort of think, how did he do that? And that sort of thing. And sort of following, you know, aesthetics a little bit. Like, um, I think the reason I sometimes I draw like Stan Wilson's and Glenn Hovind's and things like that sort of accidentally. Um, I mean, if you want, you want to make something aesthetically pleasing, and it, it, a lot of knife makers tend to go with sigmoid curves and Fibonacci numbers. Um, and I got, I sort of like mathematically designed a knife at one point. Um, and that was the recurve design, like with, you know, Fibonacci ratios and stuff. Yeah. And it, it kind of looked like a Stan Wilson or a Glenn Hoven. So I don't know if they're consciously doing it or not really, but um, sort of, yeah, chasing aesthetics like that a little bit. But I mean, keeping my stuff individual, you know, that sort of most knife makers out there are trying to make something fun functional and something beautiful. Mm -hmm. So in a way that that design aesthetic, aesthetic is almost oversaturated. 
So I sort of I sort of look at it and I think, okay, where can I go to be original? And the only place I can think of is Crazy Town, really. So, <laughs> you know, it's just <laughs> whether someone else would have the balls to do it because of the amount of trolling I get sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sort of thing, polarizing stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's so funny how people can allow themselves to be uh, polarized by a knife design. You know, it's yeah. kind of like, this is absurd. How can, so uh, you mentioned, uh, well, I, I don't want to glaze over something you talked about making an integral. Um, uh, is this a design that you have in mind? You, you were talking about the recurve that was Fibonacci based or, or was that an actual, uh, is that an actual integral? Um, not an integral in the no backspace. I mean, an um, integral, what would you call it? So you'd have like a, you know, a bolster there mm -hmm. and a piece of carbon fiber there. And rather than having a separate piece of metal there going onto, the, you know, the frame screwing on, that would be one piece of metal and then you're machining it out. And obviously with a pantograph, you can get any, any sort of shape you like out of that. Right. Just, um, you know, sort of real intricate machining operations that just, you know, it, it like serves a function because it holds a piece of carbon fiber in, but really it's just kind of an art form in itself. And then you would have to figure out how to get the pivot and everything inside and have a little, uh, so, so the engineering would really stand out on that too, as an integral handmade. I mean, that's the thing that, that is surprising to me. I know you said not in terms of the backspacer, but if it's just the forward portion, it's still the same kind of challenge, actually even harder because you still have to get the pivot and everything in there. Yeah, you'd sort of, you know, you'd want someone to pick it up because it looks nice and then they're, they're still holding it sort of 20 minutes later looking at all your crazy, you know, machining details that you've thought up and like, oh, how did he, oh, like, he didn't need to do that. Why did he do that? And just, you know, it just sort of keeps people's attention a little bit longer as well. So all those little, yeah, all those little details, really, um, just to hold people's attention. Right. And, you know, people spend a lot of money on them, so you have to deliver, really. Man, Phil, okay, so your um, your story reminds me of sort of a, like a painter, like an Andrew Wyeth living in obscurity. Um, I, I'm sorry. That, like, to me, that's a romantic notion. I don't mean that in any sort of... But you're, you're, you're kind of, you know, working under the radar, making these incredible pieces uh, that are uh, that are art and our design and useful tools um, and to me that's that's like a really interesting um, aspect of it is that is what you're making um, I don't know it's it's to be it's to be used but it's also to be pondered it's to be collected uh, but they're also stout and and ready so to me it's an it's an interesting bunch of uh, I don't want to say contradictions but uh, different different sort of uh, knives all in one um anyway it was a it was a real pleasure meeting you phil and uh finding out about uh, more about your creations pleasure being on here all right sir well uh we'll talk to you soon and you and i are going to continue this conversation uh for a few more minutes for patrons uh so i will talk to you then thanks okay. phil. hang around thank all you right. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie, probably worse. I never turn my back on an opportunity to talk about art versus design, and uh, his uh, Phil's knives most definitely uh, are a conversation starter for that. Uh, like I mentioned before, this is not a plug for Dirk Werning's channel, but you got to check out Dirk Werning's channel if you want to see some of these uh, Phil Harvey knives close up and uh, from the perspective of a true collector. Uh, that is it for this episode of the Knife Junkie podcast. Be sure to join us on Wednesday for the midweek supplemental. And of course, Thursday, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here at YouTube, Facebook or Twitch uh, for Thursday Night Knives, where you can join the conversation for jim working his magic behind the switcher i'm bob demarco saying until next time don't take dull for an answer thanks for listening to the knife junkie podcast if you enjoyed the show please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com for show notes for today's episode additional resources and to listen to past episodes visit our website thenifejunkie.com 
You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.